This is the first video of about 30 videos that I'll be making, reading my book, Finding Starlight, a chapter at a time, once a week, until I get published. I'm live right now on Instagram and on Facebook, and I'll be posting these videos to YouTube as well, along with some commentary a couple of days later. So if you have questions, comments, concerns, uh, if you're personally offended or have anything to say at all about this, go ahead and drop your comments here on Instagram or on Facebook, and I may or may not get to those in my commentary video. Uh, there's a whole disclaimer here, which I will hold up briefly for those in Facebook land and also for Instagram. Basically, this is the story of my life as I remember it, uh, told through the lens of a past life regression session, which was a guided meditation. This is my memory of how things went. People will be offended. Don't be such an asshole if you don't want me to write about you. Some things have been changed uh, a little bit for creativity, for flow of story, or simply because I don't remember everything all the time. That being said, let's get into it. Finding Starlight by me, Brittany Bowles, Chapter One. Actually, it's the prologue. November 2011. A winged beast cannot surprise his victim quite as well as one who slithers on the ground instead of armor using stealth. He creeps along under the rug, barely makes a sound, stirs nothing in the air at all, waits till no one is around. Unsuspecting happy girl dances in her room, makes believe she falls in love, as she twirls and dips her broom. Darkening the lights for sleep, she curls into her bed. Beast slithers nearer now and creeps into her head. Vicious nightmares seem so real and reality so fake. She cannot fight what she can't see. She was not looking for a snake. Scale tips at last to favor beast. Her hope fades with her fight. Forgetting why she fought at all, she caves into the night. Slithers on the ground with beast, feeds on mildewing despair, does not recall her life at all, cannot remember how to care. Beastly fangs with venom drip, Lusty, monstrous delight. He claimed his victim's life, and then he took away her flight. Receding back under the rug, he watches from below. Daylight creeping in through his victim's closed window. Drenched and cold, aching and sad, girl begins to wake. Turns her troubled face away from the dawn she cannot take. Sunlight's foreign warmth rejected, she lies in bed and hopes to die. Shallow breaths, sapped of strength, she does not even cry. But appearances, she's always kept, despite her vivid dreams. So up she gets and bed she makes. And then she stretches out her wings. A fleeting thought, like shooting star, passes through her mind of a victory she once had won, but she lets it fall behind. Chapter one, Katrina. Her house is impossible to find by accident. One must be invited through the woods, past the labyrinth and up to her front porch. The morning I arrived was bathed in golden sunlight filtering through fall leaves. She greeted me at the door in a cloud of sparkly joy, wrapping me into a warm embrace. She looked every bit the fairy godmother, 
If I slanted my eyes just so, I could almost see her shimmering wings. Her feet seemed to float ever so slightly. We went to sit in her sunroom, surrounded by windows framing the forest beyond. Crystals and gemstones of all sizes littered the windowsills and coffee table. A small birch tree grew in a ceramic pot near the couch. Although her twinkling eyes implied they already knew me quite well, she said, let's start by getting to know each other. First, I will tell you about myself. I wish I could recall exactly what she said. The camera wasn't rolling at the time, so there's no way for me to be certain. She had a husband, which is like a husband, except not anymore. He was her husband, then he wasn't. When the divorce happened, she began her odyssey. She sailed to the Caribbean and swam with sea turtles. She spent a week in the Amazon rainforest. She drank ayahuasca tea with the shaman. Despite a dozen certifications, including hypnotist, herbalist, and Reiki master, she preferred to be known only as Katrina. The marketing, it seemed, had worked. I had heard of her through some friends who worked in a shop with tarot cards, candles, and crystals. Officially, they referred to her as a past life regression therapist. I don't like titles, she said. I don't even like last names. I'm thinking of a new one for myself, maybe Rainbow or Fairy. Katrina Rainbow, I tested. I like it. When I learned about Katrina's sessions, as people called them, I wanted more information. Was this hypnotherapy? Was it spiritual astrophysical travel? Would spells, potions, drugs, or magical objects be used? Yes. Katrina said, it is all of those things. Isn't everything all of those things? I knew from our previous phone conversations that no drugs, potions, or spells would be involved. The process was simply a deliberate, guided meditation. She had learned many skills throughout her life, of which this QHHT was the newest. Quantum healing hypnosis technique would bring me into the deeply meditative state between wakefulness and sleep. Though Katrina would be leading me, she explained that my higher self or subconscious would be taking us on the journey. Has it ever not worked on someone? I asked. When I was a teenager, I volunteered to get hypnotized. I remember being fully conscious the entire time, watching myself do silly things like drive an invisible car and use my shoe as a cell phone. Every time a suggestion was made, I would slowly turn it over in my head before concluding it was harmless enough and following the order. I was in a bit of a fog, but I certainly hadn't considered it effective. Katrina assured me that would not be the case. This would be an experience guided by me, focused on giving me exactly what I would need to see, experience, or learn at the time. She called it a quantum transformation session. Some people find that they're not of this world at all, she said. Others overcome their greatest fears. It's truth being shown to you by your own subconscious or higher self, aimed at giving you a boost to live the life you've always wanted. Her tale wound to an inviting end. That is to say, she ended it with an invitation to explain why I had come to her. I remembered talking about that very thing a couple days prior. When is your appointment? Emily, my best friend, asked. We were on the phone a week before my scheduled past life regression session. At 20-something years old, I figured it was about time to get a handle on what my life was all about. It's next Saturday, I said. I talked to the lady today, though, Katrina. She sounded great. I like her. You like everyone, Emily reminded me. I nodded, though she couldn't see it. Are you ready? Not really. Honestly, I don't know how I could ever be ready for something like this. Katrina said to write down any questions I had. So I have like 10 pages, I told her. She laughed. Of course you do. To Katrina, I said, I just got married a few months ago to a man named Jeremy. We live here in Alton, though I'm not from here. 
She had lived in this town for a long time and recognized my husband's name. Where are you from? She asked, like everyone did. I'm from all over, I answered, like I always did. St. Croix, Virgin Islands, before New Hampshire. Oh, wonderful, she said, and I agreed. I know we spoke about this a little bit over the phone, but I'd like to hear it again now that we're face to face. Why is it that you're here today? What is it you hope to get out of your session? Past lives had only recently begun to tickle my curiosity. The idea of reincarnation was not new, but interest in my own origin story was growing as I distanced myself from my troubled past. If the whispers were true, that each of us chose our paths before we even entered the womb, I wondered what possessed me to pick the circumstances into which I was born. I have questions, I said. Katrina's eyes twinkled. I can see that, she replied. Where do you want to start? Even though I had been preparing for this encounter for the better part of a week, I didn't know how to start. I was not even not sure I understood why I was there. I had a hard life growing up. A lot of bad things happened to me, most of which were out of my control. I began, but struggled to continue. Katrina seemed magical enough and certainly prepared to accept any level of craziness that I might spew in her direction. Still, I wanted to convey my maturity. I was not the girl I used to be. Encouragingly, she said, I've worked with a lot of young people who have had troubled pasts. This is a safe space. That's why I'm here. This is my passion. I smiled, steadied by her confidence, and told her some of my story. Both of my parents were dead by the time I was 15. My father died before I was born, and my mom was an alcoholic, drug addict, prostitute, terrible mess of a person. After years of chaos, she finally gave me and my sister away. We lived with my sister's dad, Carrie. I grew up calling him dad since he was the only one I knew. He was also abusive, so being with him was not a good situation either. His wife and I pretty much hated each other. It was not a happy family. I left home the moment I turned 18. I was still in high school. I moved in with some friends and got into trouble. Then there were drugs. I had an affair. Late nights turned into guilty, hungover days and dead end jobs. I hated myself and wanted to die. Eventually, I admitted myself to the psych ward, stayed for a few days and realized maybe I wasn't as crazy as I thought I was. I paused for breath and looked at her. Crazy is as relative a term as they come, she answered. I suddenly saw Katrina as a woman who perhaps was more human than fairy. Then she smiled and tweaked her eyebrows in such a way that I abandoned my self-pity. True, I agreed, remembering how far I'd come. It didn't take long for me to get my shit together and realize I needed a serious change. Her expression remained calm, holding space for me to keep going. I moved away to a tropical island in the Caribbean for a while. St. Croix, that's right, I mentioned that. Where I spent time with amazing people and learned about alternative healing, meditation, Rastafarianism. I started doing yoga eating whole foods, and getting in touch with my soul. I became aware of energy all around me, and I felt more alive than I had ever been. It was like an oasis of healing in a lot of ways. I had a bit of an awakening, which I guess is easy to do in a place full of sunshine and beaches. I read some powerful books and learned about the law of attraction. At one point, I injured my knee and was able to heal myself using energy and breathing techniques. I looked at her to gauge her reaction. Does she think I'm crazy now? I asked myself. But she smiled and told me to continue. I am absolutely convinced 
that there is power and magic all around us, I declared. There is, Katrina agreed. This feels good, I thought. She gets it. On St. Croix, I went on, is where I met Emily. She and I became friends and roommates down there. She launched me into mindfulness with an incredibly simple question. What would you do if you weren't afraid of anything? I remember it that late afternoon, watching the sunset over the, Frederick, over the Frederickstead Pier. It changed my life. I broke up with my boyfriend and really started thinking about my future, asking myself what I wanted to create. Emily had family here in New Hampshire, so we decided to head here to her hometown for the summer and figure out our next move. So that's how you ended up in Wolfboro, Katrina said. How long ago was that? We got here about two years ago. I was only planning to stay the summer, like I said, but things got away from me. That summer was hard. On island, we called everywhere in the States Babylon, and that's what it felt like to me. I was shell-shocked. I thought I had figured myself out, thought that I was peaceful and aware and all that. But being back in the States in real life, I guess you could say, was challenging. I had planned to work for the summer and then follow my heart to India, where I had been invited to live in an ashram in the mountains. I planned to immerse myself in yoga and meditation for a while and see where that took me, I said, a little wistfully. An ashram, she repeated. How exciting. It was exciting, I said. But my plans changed. When I moved here, I met Jeremy. Ah, yes, of course, she said. And you're still here, I see. Yes, I rolled my eyes. I'm still here. In it for the long run, it would seem. Is that such a bad thing, she asked. I mean, no, I mused. Not a bad thing. I mean, not now, anyway. When I first came here, it felt like my world was ending all over again. It was so hard. I had some serious ups and downs. Or I guess, mostly just some downs. Tell me about that, she said. My entire life has been a series of ups and downs, really, when I think about it. Sometimes I feel amazing, connected, alive, powerful. Then the next thing I know, I'm hopeless, plagued by this, this darkness, I guess is what I call it. I let that sink in. It was the single most dramatic statement I had made so far. She did not look horrified. I said, so here I am looking for healing for light. I've come to that place where I feel nothing, really. I feel the darkness creeping in. I don't know what it is, and I want to be rid of it once and for all. What do you think it is? She asked. I'm not sure, but I'm afraid it's whatever my mom had, and my biggest fear is turning out like her an addict, or killing myself in a fit of depression. I mean, from a sociological standpoint, I tried to switch to a more rational option. This could just be considered a cycle, right? Poverty and abuse breed more of the same. My mom died when I was 15 years old. Her mom died when she was a teenager. And her mom's mom died when she was a child. All of these women had horrible father figures and abusive partners, and each went on to die of addiction and mental illness. So, I guess I've come here to see what I can learn about all of this. I want to know about the darkness. Is it a real, negative, conscious force that's haunting me? Is it simply a manifestation of my own negative thought cycles? Is it a mental illness that I have to learn to live with? What can I do to shake it once and for all? I implored. She did not answer, so I added to the list. I'd like to know how my early life shaped me. Did my trauma wound me irreparably? And of course, I want to see my past life or past lives. 
What, if any, influence do those past versions of me have on the life I'm living now? Am I repaying some karmic debt? Finally, I want to know what my purpose is. Why am I here? What's the point? My eyes were glued to the floor when I finished. That was the most important question. The one that haunted me in my darkest moments. When I looked up, Katrina's eyes were brilliant and soothing. She said it sounded a bit like manic depression. I had extreme highs where I felt alive, energetic, industrious, followed by extreme lows where I was drained, hopeless, and tired. We spoke for some time about the trends of mental illness when the symptoms tend to manifest in all sorts of textbook facts and clinical philosophy that could be at fault. Then we moved into an entirely different realm of conversation. People tend to equate happiness with high energy, she said. It's this loud, bustling, busy, excited state that screams to the world, look at me, I'm happy. It's a high and it can feel a bit manic. Sadness, on the other hand, or depression or anger or what have you, is equated with a very low vibration. It's a flat line. The thing is, neither one of those states is restful, calm, or peaceful. Happiness really is a state of peace, Katrina explained. I looked at the simple silver ring I wore on my right hand. The peace sign was off center, so I twirled it back into place. I bought it to remind myself to be peaceful despite the chaos around me. She smiled and said, true joy is found in peace. The ego is what calls for screaming, wild, manic happiness. Your soul, your higher self, the universe, or whatever you want to call the you that really is, that part of you lives in a state of perpetual peace and oneness with everything. Her voice lifted as she told me this truth. And, like a springtime song, it carried me away, or maybe within, to a place I had not ventured in a very long time. And that concludes Chapter 1 of Finding Starlight by me, Brittany Bowles. I'll make a video in a day or two to answer any questions or provide a little bit of commentary on this. In the meantime, enjoy and may you find peace.